Cindy and Linda and Robert, thank you very much for blessing us this morning. Thanks to our children who add energy and excitement and smiles to our faces. I tell Abby and Robert they ought to sing three times a month. But, um, but anyway, thank you all, and I hope you'll be here next Sunday as the choir leads us in our time of worship with all the effort they've put into the praise of the Lord. We are still walking around in the cemetery of Jesus' ancestors. You know, you never know what you'll find if you wander off into a cemetery. First time we visited Arlington National Cemetery just outside of Washington, D.C., we took the tram of which they force you to take and we got onto the tram and we rode it around to the tomb of the unknown soldier and we tried to look around a bit and the tram rider was on the horn calling us to come back to the tram and so we went back to the tram and we took it around to Robert E. Lee's mansion sitting on the top of the hill there at the highest point in the cemetery. Standing on the porch of that colonial home you can see the rows upon rows upon rows of white marble stones of those who've served in our military or been related to those who've served in our military. And we are standing on the porch looking and reading and touring the house and the guy on the tram started calling us back. And Timothy and Caleb and I were standing on the porch and you can stand on the porch and look past Kennedy's eternal flame and right to the front gate of the cemetery. And we said to the two women in our group, we can walk it, it's just right there. So we let the tram go, not knowing that the road made a long, winding loop of about two miles before you could get to that gate. And on that two-mile walk, I discovered something I didn't know. Inside Arlington National Cemetery, there are pockets of traditional monuments. And as we were walking along the road, I stumbled upon the, this monument that Sarah's going to put up for you. The monument of Abner Doubleday, the inventor of baseball, was a general in the United States Army and buried at Arlington National. The boys and I gathered around, not only for his service, but for his service to our lives, because we are better because of baseball. <laughs> and how he changed our views on the world. His monument surprised us as we walked past. One Sunday morning, I went to worship at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and I sat in the very last chair on the south row. Facing, I, was, I was toward the south, and after the service, I was waiting on the docent for the tour, and I began walking around, and I walked around the column, and there was this tomb in the aisle. Woodrow Wilson, the president during World War I, was buried not 15 feet from where I sat during that entire service. Isn't that something? President of the United States, that close, and I didn't know it. I thought everything I'd read on that building, how did I not know that? There he was. And then on a Sunday morning, waiting to go into the chapel at Duke University, waiting for the service to start, I was walking around and stumbled upon a room not far off the altar where the founder of Duke and his two sons had been carved into marble and laying in their deathbed repose. Just in a room off to the side. I took a picture of that. I came home and kind of did some measuring over here in the corner and thought maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, just maybe that might be a place that I would fit someday. <laughs> I talked to Bob Finney about it, and Bob told me a mason jar in a closet might be as close as I get <laughs> around here. But when you walk around in the cemetery, you never know what you're going to find. But I'll tell you what surprises me about Jesus' cemetery in Matthew chapter 1 is that it's who's not there. I would think Sarah would have a prominent monument in the cemetery of Jesus' ancestors. 
I would think Sarah would have a place. I mean, after all, she doesn't get the direct revelations from God that Abraham gets. She's, she's following her husband on his word that the Lord told me he was going to give us a land and make a great nation from our descendants. And she follows him. I, I would think she ought to have a monument near the gate next to Abraham's that says Sarah on it. But she's not there. I would think Rachel should have a monument. Rachel, who somehow could love that conniving scoundrel, Jacob, and stayed with him until he wrestled with the Lord and the Lord changed his heart. You would think Rachel would have a spot of prominence. But she's not there. You read through the list and you find Hezekiah, who was the king when Isaiah was the prophet, and he listened to the words of Isaiah and led the people in the words of Isaiah. His mother's not mentioned. Now his son Manasseh is considered to be in Scripture in 2 Kings the worst king in the history of all the kings. And his son Anon is just like him, the Scripture tells us. And their mothers are not mentioned. But Anon has a son Josiah who rises to the throne when he's eight years old. And in 2 Kings 22, we're told that his mother is named Jedidiah. And it seems to me that Jedediah ought to have a place of prominence in the cemetery of Jesus' ancestors. Because you had great-grandpa Hezekiah, who was a good king, grandpa Manasseh, who was a terrible king, grandfather Anan, who was a terrible king, and you've got this eight-year-old boy who comes around and turns it all around and begins to worship the Lord. And Second King says he was a righteous man who did not go to the right or the left. And I can't th help but think that Jedediah had an influence over that boy that turned him from what his grandfather was and what his father was into what he became. But she's not mentioned. There are five women mentioned as being buried in the cemetery of Jesus' ancestors. And the list surprises us. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron. Ur is Judah's oldest son, and he married Tamar. And we're told in Genesis that he was an evil man who died at a young age. And so, as tradition was, when a, wife, when a husband died, the brother took on the wife, and Onan, the second son of Judah, took on Tamar as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he died at a young age. Now Judah's sitting back scratching his head thinking, how many sons do I want to put into this bad luck? So he tells Tamar, he said, I, I have a son who, who is not yet of marrying age. When he becomes of marrying age, I will send for you and you can marry him, but in the meantime, go live with your father and among your own family. Well, Tamar looked at the calendar from time to time and calculated that that boy was among marrying age and she had not heard from Judah. And the scripture tells us that Judah was concerned that Tamar was a bad omen. So he kept his silence. Tamar, hearing that Judah is traveling, and I think knowing Judah's tendencies put on the clothes of a prostitute, went and sat by the city gate of which Judah would be passing, and as she is sitting there, he approaches her and offers her a goat for her services. She says, well, in pledge, I need your signet, your cord, and your walking staff until you pay me. He gave her the three things, and they had relations. Later in the day, Judah sends a servant back with the goat to pay the prostitute. And when he arrives at the gate, he's told, there hasn't been a prostitute here all day long. So the servant goes back with the goat back to Judah and he says, hey, couldn't find her. And he says, well, just let her keep those things. Three months pass. At the end of three months, word comes to Judah that Tamar is pregnant. And so he says, send for her and we will burn her for her sins. Isn't that something? Not a sin on Judah's part, but certainly a sin on her part. 
she meets the servant and she gives him the signet, the cord, and the staff. And the servant takes it back to Judah and realizes he has been caught red-handed. He has had an incestuous relationship with his daughter-in-law. And he tells her, you are more righteous than I. And she has twins. Now Tamar is buried in the cemetery with Jesus' ancestors. The second, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. Rahab was not dressing as a prostitute. She was a prostitute. A prostitute in the city of Jericho. And Joshua has sent two spies into Jericho to scout out the city for the conquest. And they go spend the night at Rahab's house. And the next day, the soldiers for the king of Jericho show up at the door and they say, well, we hear there are spies here from the Hebrews. And she said, oh, no. They went out the city gate and they went, they've been gone since yesterday. So the soldiers leave her house and they run out to the gate and they begin pursuing these spies, not knowing that Rahab has hid them up on the roof under shocks of grain. She releases them from the grain. They come in the house and she gives the most moving testimony of faith you'll find in that portion of the Old Testament. She says, you worship the God of, of God of all things. You worship the God who brought you out of Egypt, who divided the Red Sea. You worship the God of all creation, and I want to worship him as well. And the spies took Rahab out from the city of Jericho, and she became part of the children of God, a prostitute, a Canaanite prostitute is buried in the cemetery of Jesus. The third woman mentioned in the cemetery of Jesus is Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. Now you all know Ruth. It's an inspiring story. She's got her own book in the Bible. She is the one who said to her mother-in-law after the death of her father-in-law, the death of her husband, the death of her brother-in-law, wherever you go, I will go, and your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Ruth is an inspiring person of faith, except for one thing. She's a Moabite. And Moabites, we said, Moses tells us, Moabites have no place among the children and the assembly of God. Moabites were ancestors or descendants of the incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter. And Moses said they cannot be part of the assembly of the children of God. Well, Ruth's a Moabite. She says to her mother-in-law, wherever you go, I will go. Your people be my people. Your God will be my God. And through the instigation of her mother-in-law, she meets Boaz and they have children. But here Ruth is, on the outside of the children of God, not, not wanted. And yet she's buried in the cemetery of Jesus' ancestors. The fourth one is an insult to injury reference. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. When you think of King David, you think of two stories. You think of David fighting Goliath, and you think of David and Bathsheba. Two stories that automatically come to mind when we think of the great king. And here, the writer of Matthew, Matthew says to these Jewish readers, it's just like he just can't help twisting the knife a little bit. You remember the story. David is on the rooftop. He sees the young Bathsheba bathing. He calls for her, she comes, they have relations, he sends her back, he gets a report, she's pregnant. So he calls forth Uriah, her husband, back from the military to come and spend the night and cover his tracks. And Uriah sleeps outside saying, how can I take the pleasure of my wife while my men are fighting in the battle? So much for covering the tracks. 
David sends Uriah back to the line and he is killed in a poor military move on purpose, murdered by the king. The child that he and Bathsheba made in that adulterous affair lived seven days. And David mourned and fasted and bargained with God for all of those seven days. And then he died. The second child is Solomon. After they were married, Solomon comes along. But it just seems like the writer of Matthew can't help twisting that knife a little bit into David's legacy. But Bathsheba is mentioned as being in the cemetery of Jesus' ancestors. The fifth woman buried in the cemetery of Jesus' ancestors. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born and who is called the Messiah. When we think about Mary, we think about purity and honesty and righteousness. When they thought about Mary, they thought about a woman who had become pregnant before she was married, before the vows and before the marriage license was signed and before things were formally arranged, she is pregnant during their engagement. And there is pressure in the family and there is pressure on Joseph that this woman has been unfaithful to him. And there is scandal surrounding this marriage. She's buried in the cemetery of Jesus' ancestors. Five women, a devious daughter-in-law, a Canaanite prostitute, a Moabite, the woman who had an affair with the king, and a woman who was pregnant before she was married. Now, if, if, if Sarah can't make the list, why would those five make the list? If Rachel can't be buried in the cemetery, why would they make the list? If Jedediah, who raised King Josiah, can't make the list, why these five women? I'll give you my theory. And I have a little bit of help from David Garland, our friend at Baylor. These women buried in the cemetery of Jesus represent the rest of us. They represent the folks who made terrible mistakes in their lives and still find grace in the work of God. They represent people of heritage who would not be included among the children of Israel. They represent people who are on the outside looking in. They represent people of mistakes and failure. And yet there they are in the grace of God. But they also represent some folks who will come in the New Testament. It's Ruth who said, wherever you go, I will go, and your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. She's in the tradition of the Roman centurion who would fall, seek out Jesus and say, my servant is sick. And Jesus would say, let me go to him. And the, and the centurion said, no, if you'll just speak the word, that's enough. And Jesus said, I have not seen that kind of faith anywhere in the house of Israel. That's Ruth's kind of faith. And she's a Moabite. She's not an Israelite. It is the faith of the woman whose daughter was demon-possessed and she rushed into the house and she asked Jesus, please come and heal my daughter. And Jesus said to her, oh, it's not good to give the children's bread to the dogs. And she said, yeah, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the table. And Jesus said, great is your faith. Your daughter has been made well. And she's not a Hebrew. No, God has been working to redeem folks like us. Gentiles, Canaanites, Moabites. Folks that don't fit anywhere in the tradition of faith. People who've made mistakes and caused difficulties. God redeems. And in Jesus Christ, he makes all things together for good. 
I think that's why the five women are there. To remind us it's not always about who has the righteous faith. It's about who seeks the God of the righteous faith. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, you know the hearts of the folks in this room. There's some of us, Father, that have made mistakes in relationships. We've made mistakes in practice, made mistakes in business. Father, we thank you that we can walk around in the cemetery of Jesus and find folks just like us whom you've redeemed and whom you've called out and whom you've changed their lives. Father, we thank you that we can walk around in the cemetery and find grace for folks like us. Lord, in our time of commitment today, I ask you to speak to our hearts. Convict us, Father, about sin that needs to be repented. Grace from you that needs to be accepted. Convict us, Father, about lives that need to be changed. Lord, we pray that you will bless this time. That those who are looking for a place of service to call home, this will be the day they come and say, we want to be part of First Baptist Church. Others, Lord, have needs in their lives. May your spirit lead during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you join us now? Stand and sing, shine on us. And you come as the spirit leads you today.